two-dimensional uh, molecules here. Now, and if the world was if the world was flat like this board, then we would have two-dimensional molecules. But I want to introduce you to this. Uh, this won't be on your next test, but it's coming up soon. Okay. So basically, what we have is we have a nucleus. The nucleus still has the protons, still has the neutrons, but we have different electron orbitals. We have an S, a P, and a D orbital. All right. Now, once again, I want to introduce this to you, and I want you to give this, we'll do this a lot in this class. We'll give you something to kind of soak in for a little bit, and then as it soaks in, we'll begin to teach it. So the, the three-dimensional model won't be on your next test, but it's coming up. So the S orbitals, that's kind of cool. They travel right around the nucleus. So there's S orbitals. Oh, that's pretty cool. And we'll learn how to tell those what they do. But an S orbital can hold up to two electrons and travels right around the nucleus. So here's the nucleus. They're traveling around. Oh, well, that was the picture of the first atoms that we used to have, and all we knew about was the S orbitals. But then we go on to the P. Actually, I, I said that we've got a, a D and an F. Okay, S, P, D, and F. Speed fighter. So the first one is the S right around the, 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 the nucleus. And then we have the P's. The P's come out. Okay, and they come up, and they come back. They start out, and they originate, and then gravity pulls them back. They start out, and then gravity pulls them back. They start out, and then gravity pulls them back. But it's 6, 8, even 12-dimensional. Every different side has a P orbital. Okay, so, these are, so we have the S orbitals and the Ps. Now, what I want to show you, once again, we won't have this on our next test, but it's coming up because I want you to understand this. So these are the S's and the P's. Now, they can attach to other elements and make bonds, but then we have the D orbitals and the F orbitals. Okay, now it's kind of interesting because the D orbitals are electrons that hang around the side. Okay, so these are the D electrons. Okay, so these are, and uh, oftentimes in chemistry we will just show electrons as E minus. Okay, so these are the D electrons. Well, look, they're just setting out there. They're not even attached to the nucleus. Oh, okay. Well, guess what's on the top and the bottom? That's kind of cool, too. So now we have the F electrons, okay, and they're just hanging around at the top and the bottom, okay, so these are the F orbital electrons. So there they are, but look, they're not even attached to the nucleus. So we say, golly, where do we get static electricity? How can we just rub something off and the nucleus never comes with it? How can we get the electricity through our lines, okay, and make a constant form of electrons, but no nucleus goes with it? Oh, that's easy. Look. The D electrons and the F electrons are not even attached to the nucleus. They don't bond with anything. Oh. So that's the problem with the one-dimensional deal, is that even though we have a little, even though we have a nucleus and we draw the little orbitals, not all the electrons are in the same spot. So I want to show you that this is where we're going to go. Uh, when, you deal with, when you deal with electrons, and you, and, 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 you know, back in your old high school classes or your, your, your beginning uh, chemistry classes, we make everything one-dimensional. But ladies and gentlemen, members of the jury, you will not understand chemistry unless you begin to understand that this is real life. That it's not a two-dimensional, that's 3D, 4D, 5D, 12D. And so this is, this is important. So I wanted to introduce this, even though we're not going to have this exact one on your next test. Uh, on your test, you're going to have to do a one-dimensional diagram. But I want to begin to introduce this. Okay. So, hey, this is where it gets kind of fun. I, I, I like to get through the introduction of the chemistry and start getting to some of this cool application stuff. So, all right, well, let's move on. Uh, you are going to have on this test, you are going to have density. Density is equal to mass over volume. So let's look at that, okay? So if, here's a practice problem like you might have on your test. If a sample of gold weighs 29.42 grams uh, and has a volume of 2.8 centimeters, what is its density? Well, once again, formula for density, the mass, so the grams is a mass, so 29.42 grams divided by the volume, okay? And it tells you it has a volume. So really, uh, you know, in math, everybody's like, oh my gosh, word problems, I hate that or whatever. But in chemistry, it's so simple because the word problems tell you exactly what you need to know to plug into the formula. So it literally tells you that it has a volume and it literally tells you that it, has the, that it weighs this, which is a mass. So 29.42 divided by 2.8 equals 10 point, oh, this looks pretty scientific once again, you know, but we got to be a chemist. It says on your calculator, 10.5071429 grams per centimeter. That looks scientific, but we got to say to ourselves, what significant figures? So we look, so we're looking for the least number, okay? So here's one, here's one decimal place, and there's two decimal places, so the least is one. So our answer, so this whole thing is going to be equal to 
grams per centimeter. Once again, uh, we're just using the significant figures with the least number of uh, decimal places. Okay? Well, let's move on. Uh, we talked about a graduated cylinder here. And a graduated cylinder, whenever we have a liquid in this graduated cylinder, uh, the surface tension pulls the, the, the molecules to the side uh, of this graduated cylinder, forming what we call a meniscus. A meniscus is a curved line due to the surface tension. Now, it's important and critical that we always read the bottom of the meniscus. Because if we have a really large graduated cylinder, like we might have in the oil field, when we do chemical, uh, when we do chemical analysis in the oil field, that meniscus, you might not even be able to see it. But when we do nuclear deals where we have one-tenth of a milliliter in one graduated cylinder, we would have a big meniscus. Always read the meniscus from the bottom. You always read it from the bottom because remember the top, the top is really just pulled up to the top of the glass. Okay, so that's the meniscus. All right, now, the last thing we're going to deal with in this chapter is metric conversions. And I love this because, once again, I was talking about the old, uh, the old English conversions where we have so many ounces, uh, so many ounces in, a, in a quart, so many quarts in a gallon, that type of thing. Metric conversions is all based on base 10. So we just simply move our decimal place, okay? So here's a couple of examples, all right? So how many meters are equal to uh, 4,830 centimeters? So what we ask ourselves is which one's larger and which one's smaller, okay? So once again, we have a meter, okay? And then a centimeter is 0 0.01 meters, all right? So since this is larger, we're going from larger to smaller, then we're going to make our answer smaller, okay? So how many meters are equal to 48, uh, uh, 4,830 centimeters? Well, we take our 4, 8, 3, 1, and since this is times 0 0.01, boom. So, so once again, uh, we have, so how many meters are equal to this? So we're going to have 48.31 meters are equal to 4,830 centimeters. So see, what the, the beauty is, it's all just changing the decimal place. So let's do another one, okay? All right, so now, how many kilometers, okay? All right, so, um, how many kilometers? Uh, kilometers. 